on the uh, New Testament church. If I would ask you this morning, if I mention the word church, uh, and you know you be truthful, uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? The building, that's right. You think of some, you know, they got their own unique uh, architect when it comes to uh, churches. And that's what most people think. And uh, most people think, well, one church is as good as another. And you know, I'm inclined to agree with that. Most of them are just as good as one or the other because that don't mean nothing. <laughs> so, but when you start and studying the Word of God about the church, it's an altogether different perspective. You ask folks, folks today, are you a Christian? I'll have you to know I'm a Baptist. Or I'm a Methodist. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this, I'm a that. I'm undenominational. You know what? What You can take that in 15 cents and still can't get a cup of coffee. It won't work. It won't fly. Denomination. God is not using denominations. Now, I'm not saying that there's... I'm just saying denominations. I'm saying what they believe, what they stand on. God is uses people, not organizations, not institutions. God is a personal savior. He doesn't deal with groups. God deals with individuals. In order to be a Christian, you ha that means you have a relationship with Christ. Now where two or three are gathered together, Jesus said, there I am in their midst. He recognized two or three as a church. So uh, before we get started in the lesson today, I want you to turn to Revelations. Now, uh, you don't find that in your notes, but uh, I, I believe you'll find it in the book, in the Bible, around over the third chapter. In the third chapter of Revelation, uh, verse number 14. Now, <laughs> chapter 2 and chapter 3, you're introduced to seven churches and these churches represent I, I believe they represent dispensations of a ch the church of God at different times in history until we get to Revelations chapter 3 verse number 14 we come to the last one that's the church of Laodicea now notice as we read that and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy word works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, 
I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now this is the last church that's spoken of here in the word of God. And it's kind of a sad picture of the church. Now it's speaking here of the church. That all church is speaking there of the church. And the, the scene here before us, we see that Christ is outside of the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is the only church that he's actually outside of. He's put out. But this is the situation that we see here. And today, as you know what's going on in the world as far as the scenes, the uh, newspapers and the TV put, portray the, the moral decline of our nation and the terrible situations that exist in the people of, of the world, but especially uh, I'm more concerned with America because I live here. I just, I've often said this, this is not the country that I was raised up in. It seems like the values of the people is absolutely opposite to what the Word of God teaches. What is evil, what God speaks of as evil, the world today, that's a wonderful lifestyle. They just accept it with open arms. And as far as church membership goes, uh, all denominations are losing members. People just quit going to church. So it's really a sad commentary today of how this age is ending up and uh, what they stand for and uh, what they are I hear it every day uh, I listen to Albert Moeller's program on my computer every morning called The Briefing and he gives us a, the news in a Christian perspective and uh some of the things that's going on, it, it's just, it's out, it's just unreal. The what people believe, they just, like I said earlier, they're, they're, one denomination's not any worse than the other one. The Methodists just got through with their council. They have a council every four years, I think, when all the, the delegates come and they had, a, four years ago, they had this uh, question of homosexuality come up. And they didn't, want to de they didn't want to deal with it, so they kicked it down the road to this year. And they had, to, they had to do it this year. They had to make a ruling on it. What were they going to do? Are uh, they, uh, they going to recognize uh, hom uh, homosexuals? They're going to recognize same-sex marriage? And this was the big thing that they voted on this year. Had it not been for the African delegation that was there, it would have been. It would have passed. They would have accepted homosexuals and same-sex marriage. But the African delegation is pretty conservative as compared with the the rest of the nations. And uh, they had a bigger vote than the rest of them, so it passed. They're not going to accept now as a stand, but one of the major uh, delegates from the United States said, well, the, it ain't over yet. <laughs> 
So, you know, it's pretty clear what the Bible teaches about that subject. It's, it's, it's pretty plain. But today people have a way of, uh, of uh, accepting anything, even though uh, the Bible teaches again. That doesn't really matter a whole lot today. But in this study of the New Testament church, I believe we owe it to ourselves to go through the Bible and see just what, what uh, is God's standards for a New Testament church. What does the Bible, you know, I was raised up in a church as a kid. I never dreamed that there was, I, I, well, I just never, I thought all churches were all alike and they all believe like we did, you know. I, I didn't know anything, you know, as a young boy. Uh, you just don't, I thought my church was it. That's it. Well, as you grow older, you find out things are not always as they seem to be. But the Bible does teach about the church. Well, we ought to really look at it very close and make sure that we're following as close as possible what God designed the church and what he is looking for in that church. All right, this is part two of our study that we studied, uh, we started last week. And I just, I, I wrote some uh, introduction remarks here before we get into the word of God, but just follow along with me. In approaching the study of any doctrine or truth in the word of God, it is well to remember that the practice of the Holy Spirit in the writing of the revelation has been generally to give a key passage in which will serve as a foundation upon which the whole revelation concerning the matter is found, whatever the subject that you're studying. You'll find it in different passages throughout the word that you build your, your doctrine or your beliefs on. So we have a key passage. There are a number of important passages dealing with the various aspects of the church, its organization, and its work. But the passage, but the passages that are basic, giving the great fundamental principles of the church existence are the statements of our Lord recorded in Matthew 16, verses 16 through 19, and also Matthew 18, verses 15 through 22. Now, these are the actual words of our Lord as concerning the church. Now, in the first passage, talking about the one found in the 16th chapter of Matthew, in the first passage, the fundamental principles of the is is of the structure of the church are revealed. The fundamental structure of the church is revealed in the, in the first passage found in Matthew. Now, we're not going to be... I thought when I started my lesson that I would have enough time to take both of these passages, but I didn't. I run out of time that... Uh, so we'll catch that next week. Let's look first in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. We'll begin reading at verse number 13. Now this is the first time that Jesus mentions anything about the church. All right? Now you know there is a, there is a law in, when you're studying the Bible. And it's the law of first mention. The law of first mention is what it's called. But 
when you see uh, something about uh, a subject that you're, uh, you're studying and you find it for the first time, the first time it was ever mentioned. I'll just give you a, an example. It talks about when uh, over in Genesis that Christ sanctified the seventh day. He sanctified it. Therefore, he called it a Sabbath. Now, that's the first time that it was mentioned, sanctified. Now, what does the word sanctify means to set apart and declared to be holy. That's the first time that that word was used, that word sanctified. And therefore, that's, that means that's the law of first mention. In other words, that's what the first uh, definition of sanctification, that's where you'll find it. The very first time it was ever mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis when God got through creating. You know, he said he sanctified the seventh day and, and made it holy. You see, that's the law of first mention. Now here in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to find the law of first mention on the subject of church. It's the first time that Christ mentioned it. Notice in Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now I want you to notice, he asked first, the disciples, as a group, he asked all of them. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter, all right. He was always one to ready to say, to speak, wasn't he? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should Tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now I want you to notice, first of all, some basic facts concerning his church. He says, I will build my church. The church is his and he alone will build it. He did not say that man would build it for him or that the church would build itself. Christ is to engage personally, actively, directly in the whole work of building his church. Now here's what I, here is the statement that I made last week, any time a congregation of people, they go into an, into an organization, denomination, Christ is no longer the head of that church or that body. It is his church. But see, everybody, have you ever noticed the strain of man? He wants to control everything, doesn't he? Yeah, 
He wants to be the person. That's just a human trait, I believe, of man. He wants to control everything. But Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm gonna, I am going to build my church. The church does not belong to man. It belongs to Christ. Amen. He's the author and the finisher of it. Amen. Let's look at 2 Corinthians in your Bible. Let's look at, at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. i tell you what, while we're looking, let's just look at 16 too. We'll start reading at verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, based on that, you know, when you, when you come across that word therefore in the Bible, you want to find out what it's there for. <laughs> therefore, you look up above. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Amen. Now then, here you now you're going to see what your part is in this church. Therefore now, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though as through as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God. For he hath, been, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But I, what I want you to see here, where are we at in this picture? You know, I said Christ is building his church. But we are his ambassadors. In another place, Paul said, for we are workers together with him. We work with him, but we do not do the building. It's Christ that does the building. Amen. And each, each stone, amen, each stone in this building we call a church is there, is there through the predestinated will and purpose of God. Amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Remember, I said Christ is building this church. He's the architect. He's the contractor. He is the one that's building this church. Amen. Now notice in Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 4. Hey, do you all remember reading in the scripture when Solomon built his temple? You remember uh, uh, the stones were cut out and hewed, not in the, not in Israel, but in other country. It was already it come pre 
pre-made, in other words. There was no sound of a hammer or a chisel in the country. That stone, that building came together piece by piece. I listened, I heard uh, this morning, getting ready to church, we always tune in on and listen to uh, John Hagee as he preached. And he was telling this morning, some of those stones in, in the building of that temple, you remember Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another. But some of those stones were tons. They weighed tons. One stone would weigh tons. It was uh, like 10 foot long and real wide, and they weighed tons. It, it, was, it was a massive, uh, it was a massive construction job. And uh, some scholars believe that when they built that temple that they, they had the uh, use of uh, uh, I want to say uh, scientific their science was so far above uh, ours they used uh, what kind of uh, atomic. atomic they used atomic power to build the, the temple because they had a way, they knew how to do it. I don't know, science is still trying to discover how the pyramids, how that they could build those pyramids. It's, it's beyond, they just, we don't have a machine today that would lift those stones that high. But anyway, I don't want to get off on that. All right. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I'm talking about these precious stones that are going to go into this what we call a building. It's a spiritual building. All right. Look at verse number 10. Well, let's look at verse number nine first. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also... We have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Everybody see that? God, there's, hey, he has left man absolutely nothing to do. God is doing the work. And his purpose is going to be completed he doesn't do anything on the spare of the moment. No, the scripture says in Acts chapter 18 or 15, 18, known unto God are all of his works from the beginning. God does not have a new plan. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now this church that he's building is a supernatural structure. Amen. And we are the ambassadors of him. We are not the builders. He is the builder of this church. Amen. All right. Let's notice verse 18 there. The church is built on a rock. Y'all see that? The church is built on a rock. The rock is a divine revelation of who Christ is. That's what he told Peter that day. Upon this rock, who told you that? You did not learn what you spoke to me there, Peter. You did not learn that by fishing with me. You did not learn that by your fleshly fellowship with me. My Father revealed that to you. That's a divine revelation. And he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. 
His church is built on a divine revelation of who he is. Amen. It's not built on some denominational doctrine. It's not built upon some what man thinks about it. The church is a supernatural structure. Amen. That's exactly right. All right. The rock fact is not a doctrinal theory, but a living, active, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent person of Christ. Amen. And Christ, the Bible declares him to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the immutable God. He never changes. Amen. But he is always the same. Amen. Now notice, I've got some scriptures. Psalms 118, verse number 22. The stone which the builders refuse. Remember now that stone is a, in the spiritual language, it means revelation. He says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Notice now, the stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. Israel rejected that revelation. Who are you, they would say. Who do you make yourself to be? Many, many times over there in St. John chapter 6 and chapter 8, they're challenging him. Who are you? Who you make yourself to be? And he would say, I am the bread of life. I am the tree of life. I am, the, I am God. And I am. He would always declare himself to be, I am. But they rejected it. They rejected it. This is the Lord's doing. But look at it. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Christ is a snare to them, and he is a trap for them. Therefore, that revelation of who he is that they rejected is going to be their downfall. Notice in the Amplified, and he shall be a sanctuary, a sacred and indestructible asylum to those who reverently fear and trust in him. I like that. Those who reverently fear and trust in him. But he shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And that's what it turned out to be to them. Today, the majority of the Jews still reject him. Now, there are a few because of the election of God, there are a few that receive him.